James 1.12. Blessed is a man. The word is is not actually in your text, uh, in the original text. <clears throat> becomes a title for the subject matter, verse 12. A blessed man. There's no definite article with it. It should be, it's a title, a blessed man. And then it describes who this blessed man is. Who, perverse, who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved through the trials, he will receive the crown of life that will be at the judgment seat of Christ, which the Lord has promised to those who love him, the crown of life. Stephanos is the word for crown, Stephanos. There are two words for a crown in the Bible, in the Greek language. Diadem is one, that's what a king wears. That's a royal crown. Stephanos in the Bible is a victor crown. The victor crown. It is interesting <clears throat> that the Roman soldiers at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ wove something like a crown that you would award at an Olympic game. They gave them different floral types of arrangements. They were Stephanos's. In the Olympic games, you, wore, you won that, and then you got awards for winning it in the Greek Olympics. And the Romans took that custom over. At the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, if you recall, they, put a, they, they developed a crown, a Stephanos, in mocking him, it was the victor's crown. It was always known as the Stephanus was a victor's crown. They built this around him, mocked him, and put it upon his head and pressed it in. Uh, you remember that was the, the uh, crown of thorns. And it was called a Stephanus. They put that on there and mocked him, king of the Jews, right? Because uh, uh, above his head, where the crown was, they put in the different languages of the day, right, king of the Jews. And so it was used, the Stephanos, in great mockery of what he, what he oh, so you're the, the hero of the day. And here is your victor's crown. Little did they know that that was true. And when he would be raised from the dead and ascend back to the father, he would be prepared to wear the diadem crown as king of king and lord of lords just interesting interesting to tell you that the crown they put upon his head and they mocked him with was called a stephanos maybe that will help you the next time you read that to get a bigger picture of the total mockery that was being uh, the humiliation listen the great thing that God wants us all to become in this life is humble. That meaning, not by the world's pressures, but by the, but by the grace of God in your life as you come to appreciate deeply the grace that God has for your life in every category. It produces humility. And you will need every bit of that to walk for Christ through the humiliation of this world called undeserved suffering. And when you wear it right, it has an enormous impact upon a lot of people. Not when you go through undivert suffering as if it was humiliation, but when you go through it as being humbled by it. A, a, a joy and a pleasure to suffer for the sake of Christ, that God would count us worthy as he did Job to go through the fire and come out pure gold. And that's our subject today. And that's where we're going to go with this. After a word of prayer. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence. I believe we're priest. And what I say to my congregation here. As applies to those who are visiting with us by the internet. It's very important. 
that you have classroom etiquette. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. It has to be learned and lived by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't study it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. To remove carnality, you have to confess your sin. According to 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. That cleansing puts you back into a position of sanctification. You're already saved. You need to be back into fellowship with the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how you learn the Bible. That's how you live it. Learn and live it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we're thankful today for these who have come our way to study with us. Preparing ourselves, Father, for the, for the great run. It's my... We don't pick and choose the race we run. The Father picks it for us. But once it's been picked for us, we have to choose to run the race to the finish. I pray that we would have all these years of Bible study be prepared to do that because... There are a lot of people in the bleachers who watch the great Olympics of the Christian life. And we are to enter the, we are once entered into the race, we are to run the race to the finish. We are to keep the faith. And there will be a crown. There will be crowns awarded to us. And those crowns will be important in the next life whether they're important in this life, whether we ever understand how important they are, they're enormously important to our life in the next life. I pray we would grasp that today, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, <clears throat> I went back and took a look, and this is our eighth lesson in the book of James, and we've speeded right up to verse 12. So we are really rocking along here. The theme of this verse, the theme of this one verse is a blessed man. Now, <clears throat> I need to tell you that this word man is anair. It's not anthropos. Yet, anthropos and anair are really important names for mankind. They, they can be used generically. Like in this passage, it's used generically. It's not referring to a man as a male but rather as a man in generics, as a terp certain type of person. And therefore, this is often translated a noble person. That would be a believer who has enough growth maturity. Are you getting warm? Yes. Let, let me take a break here. I just happen to, but I, sometimes I don't really, I can't really tell because I have a coat on him. Then I get heated up talking, and then you put a blanket on. I go, well, I guess things are different. <clears throat> All right, the blessed man. Now, you know, people use that word a lot, blessed, don't they? Have a blessed day, have a blessed this, have a blessed that. <clears throat> and there's a lot of truth to what the, how they're using that. Um, the word blessed today has become a, a coined phrase, almost like amen in the old church. People use this blessed all the time. It's become kind of a code word, don't you think? When I hear somebody say to me, have a blessed day, I go like, oh, there's a brother or a sister. And I respond to that in, in like manner because it's kind of like a code word for us. Um, What's interesting about, about the, this, uh, well, I'll talk about it in a moment, but the word man, anair, it is a noble one, and it refers to a believer, and uh, a believer that has grown enough in spiritual maturity to be given an assignment of undeserved suffering. Listen, listen to this. Blessed is the noble believer, a noble believer, one who is spiritually mature enough to be to receive this. Blessed is the man who endures. That's patient as hupomone, patient and that's patient endurance. Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he is try, tried, he receives the crown of life. The crown of life, which the Lord, which is not in your text, it's italics, 
has promised to those who love him. And so he's talking about it, the, that the, a blessed person is one. You don't choose the race. I, 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 you just got to understand this. You don't choose. You don't get to choose your suffering unless it's self-induced. But if it's undeserved suffering, God chooses it for you. And once that's chosen for your life, now it may be a short course, it may be a long course, it may be a forever course. But whatever course he chooses for you, you're to run that course to the finish. And in this case, it's undeserved suffering. In this case, if you finish, the, if you, fin you don't have to, quote, win. What you're after is the prize. You don't have to win the race. You have to finish it. And if you finish it, you get the prize. In this case, the prize is the crown of life. There are four crowns we'll talk about today in this study. My main thought to you is that we're not talking about a man as a male. We're talking about a believer who has reached spiritual maturity. And God has chosen, like Job, God chose the race. Okay, Job, I'm going to choose the race, and you're going to run it. Right? Yeah, you choose it. He would have never chose us. You will never choose what God picks out for you. But once it's picked for you, God has picked the perfect course, the perfect race for you to run. You just have to know that in your heart. God is faithful. Listen, you better write this verse down in your paper because you're going to need it at some point in your life, whether you think you do or not. Philippians 1.29. It has been granted for you not only to believe, but to suffer for his namesake. And when he picks that suffering aspect in your life, and only you know it, you know it when it gets there, because you didn't pick it. He picked it for you. And when he picks it for you, he's got the right person entered in the right race. Your job now is to run it to the finish. It could be a short distance. It could be a long distance. It could be a life distance. Right? Remember, Job entered, God entered, entered Job into two races, right? And let him complete those races before he died. Right? So, I mean, it could go either way, but I'm after this word anair, which is uh, without gender. It, it's not talking about a male or a female. It's talking about a specific type of believer, one who has reached a spiritual maturity and is capable of when God enters him in the race, has the capacity to run that race to the finish because he has learned that he, this, his strength and everything comes from the Lord and not from himself. You go like, I, I, I don't think I can make another day of this. Not, not alone. Not alone. He's not going to enter you into a race that he's not equipped you to run. So don't sit around and whine about it because that's not how you win the race. And when I say win the race, I mean win the prize at the end of the race. All you got to do is finish the race. 2 Timothy 4.7. All you got to do is finish it. Now, I think Anair is for this subject matter is used really well. Notice that on your piece of paper in Philippians 4.13. What I'm talking about is the Anar, Anair that's described in Ephesians 4.13, which is about spiritual growth. Here's what it says. Until we all attain... This word attain means to reach and maintain. This is where Bob Thiem got the idea of reach and maintain spiritual maturity into dying grace. This is the word. This is the concept. This is where it came from. Until we all attain, notice it's an aorist active subjunctive, and the word until is a trailer hitch. It's a preposition, an unusual preposition, that goes back to verses 11 to 12. This is verse 13. It goes back to spiritual gifts and the pastor who's teaching you spiritual growth. You're reaching until we all attain. Means to reach and maintain spiritual maturity. 
to the unity of the faith, to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Watch the three twos. That's a T-O. Watch the three T-O's. Till we attain to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of Man, to a mature teleos in air. And the third to, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, that's being able to maintain it through super grace unto dying grace. See, that last phase is taking this person that has maturity all the way through suffering maturity into super grace. God has, listen, he has a great, now, our subject today is that what you win in time is you're going to wear in eternity. You won't wear the crown of, of life in this life. You'll wear it in the next life, and it'll be a prestigious sign, symbol. So, I think Ephesians 13, 13 really shows you the mechanics behind the blessed anair that is now because they're in suffering. Listen, I'm not looking for hands, but listen to me now. If you are in suffering, that's not of yourself. It is a gift from God. He has entered you in a race. This lesson's for you. And if you're not that person, then you are going to become that person because it's been granted for you not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer for his namesake. You're not going to get out of the devil's world without, without this, this testing going on because it's, it's to develop the character of your, you, it's to burn off the flesh and get pure gold. The spiritual identity of Christ in your life. The idea of suffering is to get rid of the, of the old person in you and allow the new person in you to shine. Suffering really does that. Suffering really does that. And, and it does it. It does it. I don't want to say speedily, but it sure does it constantly. So, this lesson is for you. And I want to tell you, not only are there good things in this life in developing you spiritually and having an enormous witness to other people, but in the next life, this is going to pay you high dividends. You have no either. It is impossible for me to tell you how important crowns are going to be like for you in the next. And listen, it's going to come out of suffering. So this is important. In some way or another, in this one, the crown of life, a blessed man. Now, when I looked at my text and I saw that the blessed man was a title, I looked at it and I saw three sections. I saw, here's what's important for undeserved suffering for the crown of life. Perseverance. That's running when you don't feel like it. That's doing things you don't feel like doing. That's sometimes doing things that are necessity in your life that you just have to Put a stick in your mouth and jaw, chew on it to get through it. Thank God it's not every day. But there's a reminder every day that you are running a race. Some days are worse than the others. Some, sometimes the information that's being fed off that suffering is different from day to day. But you're running a race. And God has chose that for your life. I, I don't know. You think, well, that's not. Why did he choose me? I don't know. But I tell you, he chose whatever suffering you're in. He chose that for you because you're capable of dealing with it. And he's got enough stuff in you developed over the years in you to take you to the, to the finish line. That part I know. So here's the key to it. Once, you're, once, you've, once God has selected the race and you're in the race, perseverance is a key. That's hupo mone. Hupo mone means to patiently endure it. Patiently endure it. If you were a rate runner, it would be pace yourself. It won't take you long in your suffering to learn you have to pace yourself. Agreed? 
I mean, there's certain things I have to do at this time of the day or I cannot get them done. I've got to do certain things. I may have to throw something in the crock pot because I go to work. And when I come home, I, I, could never, I couldn't throw anything in the crock pot. I'm a crock pot myself. I'm in need. And so you learn how to patiently endure it. You, you know how to pace yourself. And so you learn to do that. But listen, God will show you how to do it. Perseverance is something that he's a master in. And you're not. This is all a new journey for you. Unless you've been running that race for years. And then sometimes you just get so tired of persevering. Therefore, you need to understand that patient endurance comes from patient endurance. Both the patient, like the flesh, not, you know, the spirit, not the flesh. The patience, part of that. And the endurance part of it is that inner strength that Christ gives and only Christ can give. If you're trying to figure out a short way out of this, there is none. Perseverance. But perseverance, that word focuses on the pain of the journey, patient endurance focuses on the positive part of it. And so I, even though perseverance is a good word for this, to me, when I hear the word perseverance, I think of, the, of enduring the pain of the journey, not the pleasure of it. Patient endurance says focus on the, the, the journey on a positive side, not a negative. And that's what Paul is trying to tell his church because the church is going through... There are a lot of races being run, persecution, uh, physical, emotional, mo all of it. And so Paul is dealing with that. The second word, and so he says, blessed is the man, that's the theme, who has persevered, that's a present tense, as in, in the midst of the race, under trial, that is the race that God has picked, for once he has been approved, that is, he is in the race, he is doing well in the race, it's not based on how well you think you're doing. It's how well God knows you're doing. And once he sees you, listen, approve means that he will settle down in your soul the race you're in, the suffering you're in. See, when you're going through it, you're not there. At some point in that, he's going to say, he's going to put an approval on it. With, within your own soul. It may be just as it well, looks like, look, this may be one of those things where you say in your head, and maybe a doctor says it and a couple friends, you know, this is probably going to be the way your life is going to be. That may be true. It may not be. But you know why that is? That's coming to a place of approval. At some place in the race, you got to say, look, I wasn't promised I would be first. I was promised I would finish and that I would be rewarded for it. And that is true. And so I, I speak to your hearts today in that manner. The second word that caught my attention was the word promotion. The promotion for you will come at the judgment seat of Christ. I mean, it is possible for you to get promoted in this time. Jo jo Job was. He ran that first race. He completed it. He got rewarded. He ran a second one. And in the end, God, God showed him enormous blessings. For you and I, we may run it, we may get through it, and we, and we may look back and go like, I don't want to ever do that again. But thank you, God, because you got me through it was something I didn't think I could get through. And so there's a reward in that. There's also going to be a reward for you on the other side. If you, if you finish the race, it may be a short race, it may be a long race, it may be a life race. You're going to get, listen, if you complete the race, you get the prize. If this is undeserved suffering, then you're going to get a crown. And he may ask you to enter another race. <laughs> you did so well and you had such a good testimony. I mean, I mean, you're selling uh, Pepsi Colas and I mean, your name is on brands now. In the kingdom. Don't think that <laughs> if you do well, I, you'll get a Pepsi commercial. Uh, I'm not suggesting that. Then, and, and so he says, he will receive, notice, notice that's a future middle indicative. He will receive the crown of life. 
the Stephanos with a definite article, with a definite article with the word life. You know what Zoe means? It means the life of God. If you study this life out, if you study Zoe, it, it, begins, it begins with Jesus Christ, and when it enters us, we're talking about a quality of life. It is, the quality of life, as John 10, 10, is the abundant life of God. Listen to me now. You're missing this. You in suffering? Are you, are you in, in this race of undeserved suffering? You didn't choose it. He chose it for you because he understands you're the person that can do this. And he understands that he's got spectators. When you run the race, there's spectators. When you run the race of undeserved suffering and you do it, listen, just know this. There's a, there's a large audience watching you. And that's the influence that God's going to have on other people through your suffering. You won't even have to say anything. They'll say it for you. They'll say it for you. The Stephanos, but notice that it's the crown of what? Life. But it's not bias. It's not life that we live where we put on a certain dress or a certain coat and tie and all that. It's not based on the food we eat. Bias where you get biology. That, that we're not talking about genes and whether we wear them or think about them in science. We're not doing that. This is Zoe. This is the life of God in you that's being manifested. You're going to receive the crown of life because in this life God put you in the angelic conflict, allowed you to run a race that he chose for your life. And you may run, run several of them just because you're a good runner. God keeps entering you into races. I, I don't know. So please don't take that to heart. I don't know how that works. So I don't want to discourage you in the race you are thinking if you run it really fast and get through with it, he'll give you another one. I don't know. I don't, don't misread me in that. You're going to receive the crown of life. And there's a good reason why they call it. You always pay attention to what the crown represents. The Stephanus crown always represents not only a race, but a victory. Then there's a promise. I see a promise in that. The crown of life, which, the crown of life, the which, which is the crown of life, the Lord has not there promised is as an aorist middle indicative the crown of life God has promised to those who love him who stay in because they love God it didn't say because they love themselves it didn't say because they love their family it didn't say because they love the church it did not say they loved anything about anything but they love God you know why because God will get you through it and as you run this race from day to day and you're able to continue and you're able to do what you didn't really imagine you could do and you're still doing it. There, listen, you grow in your love towards, towards God. But if, if, if it wasn't God, I couldn't have got up Monday morning. If it wasn't for God, I couldn't have got up and done what I did. If it wasn't for God, I couldn't do this. If it wasn't for God. See, he's going to develop that. You and God are going to become, become closer in your relationship than you could ever imagine because you went through what you went through. That's the good news. That is the good news. And what is God getting out of this? Your love. Oh, you know what he gets out of this? He, get, he gets your love to those who love God. Paul, I want you to put your eyes on 1 Corinthians where God chooses your race and you choose whether to run it. He chooses a race and you choose whether to run it. I'm in 1 Corinthians 9 and he talks about the race where crowns are given. And I put on your paper the qualifier, the qualification, qualability, and then disqualifications. Here's verse 24. And I left a little space because everyone in here could go through some undeserved suffering 
if you're a believer in Christ. So it'd be well worth your time. Do you not know? You do now because I'm going to teach it to you. Do you not know? You are going to now because I'm going to teach it to you. You do not know, but I'm going to teach, right? So when we leave here, we, we, we now know. All right. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Remember, winning is finishing. And what is the prize? A crown. And what goes with it after, you, after it's won? Run the race. You don't pick it. He picks it for you. That's Hebrews 12.1, by the way. Hebrews 12.1. He picks the race. Listen, here's what Hebrews, here's what Hebrews 12.4. Run the race, well, listen to me now, that's been set before you. Did I say that? Run the race that's been set before you. Listen, here's what you need to know may be worth putting on your paper. The Lord chooses the race, and we choose to run or not. If you run and finish, you get the prize. If it's undeserved, if the race, if the race is undeserved suffering, you get the crown of Zoe life. Okay? I mean, there's going to be four crowns you're going to discuss, we're going to discuss. Okay? In verse 25, look at verse 25. Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. Talking about the Olympics, they then do it to receive a perishable reef crown. That's a Stephanus, by the way. But we, an imperishable reef or, or crown, a Stephanus. Look, whose job is it to compete or run the race? Mine. Your job. Run the race. You didn't pick it. You didn't choose it. God chose it for you. Because he understands your capability better than you do. He would have never put you. Listen, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he doesn't ever put you in a race that you couldn't win. You understand? That you couldn't run. He'd never do that. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells you he would never do that. So what is my responsibility is to keep running. Stay in the course. Stay, stay, stay on the course. I don't care if you walk. I don't care if you limp. I don't care if you crawl. Finish. You, get, you fall down. You say, I can't get back up. Take a deep breath. Have a word of prayer. Get back up. He's never going to put more on you than you can bear. And you're going to learn to appreciate the omniscient power of God. You're going you're gonna to know more about the character of God when you get through your race than you would have ever learned in a classroom. I'm talking about personal empathy inside knowing. You understand what I mean? Set in classroom, you get theory. I'm talking about the real deal out there, gutting it out. And what you're going to do is you're going to learn to have a closer relationship with God going through it than you would ever had not going through it. That's what Paul learned in, first, in 2 Corinthians 12. So keep running. What are you running for? The prize. What is the prize? The Stephanos crown of life. The crown of life. If it's undeserved suffering. In verse 26, he says something. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I run in such a way as not without aim. Purpose or goal minded. Why are you running? Why do you do this? Why don't you curse God and die? Right? When Job was running his race, was falling down, getting back up, falling down, getting back up. His wife on the sideline as his coach said, listen, at some point, why don't you just stop, curse God and die? 
I don't know that she meant that in a mean-spirited way. I used to hear that, and I'd think, what a mean woman. But over the years, I've grown to kind of appreciate the coaching side of this. Run in such a way. And he uses the word without aim, which is an interesting word because it has the alpha privative on the front of Adelos, Adelos, Adelos and it means with, without uncertainty. In other words, stopping in the middle of a race, going, why did I, why am I doing this? Why did you do this to me? Why am I doing this? Okay, are you through crying? Because you're not going to get out of the race. You can't go back to the starting line. You can't step out of the course. This race, you've got to, look, Listen, I love the fact that God don't mind you weeping a little bit, whining, crying. Listen, he puts up with more stuff than I could imagine. He does in my life. <laughs> I mean, I go like, I wouldn't put up with me in a minute. I know. I know. Me and Jane are the only two people. And sometimes I question Jane, you know. Sometimes I feel like I'm the only one putting up with you. Run in such a way without aim, uncertainty. Why? Hebrews says, keep your focus on Jesus. You know why? Because he is the author and finisher of your race. Keep your focus on the race. Keep your focus not on your suffering, not on your race. Keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Lift your head up. Quit getting down on yourself. Lift your head up. That Lift your head where your prayers are going. They're not going down. They're not going into the earth. They're going up. Lift your head where your prayers go. Get your focus on him. He is the author and finisher of the race you're in. That's the point. Stay focused on the prize, which is the crown, which you will wear for eternity that will give you status as you never believed. Being qualifiable, that's what we talked about. Disqualification, four things. Here are four things that be well worth your time. In 2 Timothy 2.5, we're told that you have to compete in a game according to the rules. If you ever played a sport where there weren't rules, and listen, you know what the rules are? You violate them, you get penalty, penalties for it, right? So Paul talks about in the running idea, uh, you've, got to, you've got to run according to the rules. Run according to the rules. There are rules. There are certain things. You cannot violate the rules. You can't go back to the finish line and start again. You can't step out and call your mother and brother and aunt and uncle and pastor and all that. You can't do that. You have to Play according to the rules. And there are rules set up. And let me tell you the rules. Undeserved suffering, in this case, the crown of life. You gotta, you've got to stay in the course, and you've got to go according to the rules. The second thing, the second thing is you've got to finish the race that's been set before you. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verse 7. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. That's the motto. If you're, that's a verse you ought, to, you ought to have memorized. If you don't, you ought to live it and hold to it every day because that's a promise from God to your life. The third is the race has to be run in the spirit. It can't be run in the flesh, Galatians 5, 16, and 17. Your flesh can't carry the load. If you think that this is medical, that all this is in your life is medical, you're wrong. There's a medical connection to it. Don't you know that all the people that Job went to on, on his last run he had, every doctor in the world would have gave him a different opinion. He still, they, they gave him medicine up to his wazoo, and he still, I don't know what a wazoo is, so interpret it yourself. I just said that. It came out too quick. And uh, I'm thinking Michigan now. And I'm thinking, oh, I better retract that. I don't know what that, but you got to run, you got to run according to the spirit, not the flesh. You're not going to make it in the flesh. You're not going to make it. You will not make it. 
This is spiritual run for spiritual people. God entered you into this race. You didn't enter yourself. So it's got to be run in the spirit and not the flesh. And fourth, it's got to be run in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It's got to be run by faith and not by sight. This is not a race in, uh, by sight. There, there's no logic to it. There's no empiricism. It, listen, this race can't be run one that way. So you got to run. So be sure, don't get disqualified. Paul goes into a pretty good discussion on that, doesn't he? See, that was verse 27. As for, I buff up myself and I keep my slave, at least possibly after I've preached to others, I myself be disqualified. Disqualified. Uh, here's the second thing. Once a believer enters a race for the victor's crown, there are, uh, your, pay, your, your notes on your paper is not right. It should say, there are at least three ways. That's how it should read. I, I read that this morning, uh, sat down with a cup of coffee, and I went, oh, wow, what did you, what <laughs> I don't know, but it should be. There are at least three ways the church age believer could fail to receive it. I just mentioned for not laying aside, listen to what Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says. By not, this continues my subject. By not laying aside every encumbrance and sin that does so easily entangle us. See, that tells you that once you engage in the race and you go, okay, okay I got to run, I got to run it to finish. Listen, there are things that you've got. What would be a runner's encumbrance? It'd be a sweatsuit. You go like, well, I've looked at my competition. I, I think I'll just wear my sweatsuit. Sweat, I think I can run this race with my sweatsuit on. And then you get along the way and you go like, no, I can't because everybody's passing me. I can't do that. That's an encumbrance. That's an oskos. That's an O-G-K-O-S in the Greek language. That's having something bulky, uh, something that, is, that you're wearing, something in your life that's dragging you down. Uh, Al would call that old man Cosmos Diabolicus thinking, and he'd be right because he's talking about transformation in verse 2 by the renewing of your mind. That's exactly what it is. Every weight, every bulk, every weight is what this means. If, you're, if you were going to go, if you're going to take O-G-K-O-S and look it up and try to find that word, you won't find it in a typical uh, concordance or Greek thing. You have to look up the word weight. That's a W-E-I-G-H-T, just like the King James says. That's what the G King James says. That's called an encumbrance. It calls every weight. And, uh, and, of course, this is, a, this is a spiritual race, and so we're talking about spiritual things. The encumbrances and the sins that so does easily entangle us. Uh, by not running with endurance, the race set before us in the Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Listen, there's no sense resisting it. There's no sense resisting it. Look, at, I understand we all do that in the beginning. We go to the doctors, we go to this, we go to that, we go to prayer three times or four times, five, whatever. And it's still there, Monday morning, oh, geez. I took the medicine all week, and it's, I've still got it. After a while, the doctor goes like, I don't know, look, it's just something. So when that comes, when that all reads out in your life, stop resisting. Now, I'm, I'm listen, God understands you've got to look at all the things. You're a rational person. You've got to look at all the rational connections could be to make sure that it's not something that I do. Maybe it's my diet's bad. Maybe this is bad. Maybe that. Listen, that's not okay. Listen, that we're rational people. At some point, we come to the end of all that, and we know that this is undeserved suffering. All right, do you understand that, people? Please understand that, or else you're just going to go nuts or, or nuttier. Er, not er. Listen, 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, listen, finish the race. L finish the race. Paul, Paul says in Philippians 2, 13, that's, that's not on your paper. It should be if you're interested. It says, Paul said, I did not run in vain. You know, that's a guy. That's a guy who has ran it, fall down, got up, had to refocus his thinking. 
because sometimes the pain and the suffering can become overwhelming without the power of God in my life to overcome that. He said, I didn't run in vain. You know what, I mean? you know what that means? He means, listen, I crossed the finish line no matter what. And you know what he would say? To God be the glory. That's what he'd say. And to God be the glory. Listen, Paul ran several races. If you want to know all the races he ran, you should read 2 Corinthians 11. He records them. More than I would care to run. <laughs> More than I'd care to run. The victor's crown will be the, ref listen to me, the victor's crown will be the reflected glory of the church age believer's faithful service on behalf of Christ in the Christian life. That's, that's exactly what it is. And it'll be rewarded. It will be re rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. I put all this on your paper. I'm going a little bit faster because I'm out of time. And Ernie's got the second half. Therefore, the victor's crown is a big deal. The Stephanus crown. Listen, it is the reflective glory of the church age believers, faithful service to Jesus Christ, no matter what the circumstances in eternity. And you will wear those crowns. And let me tell you, dear people, they are big deals. And everybody has a chance to get a crown. And they're big, big deals. You have, I can't tell you what a big deal they are. So here are the four crowns. Point four, here are the four crowns to be awarded at the judgment seat of Christ. There's the crown of life, which we've talked about, is awarded at the judgment seat of Christ to the church age believer who patiently endures undeserved suffering, who finishes a course, uh, to die in grace, whichever comes. I mean, whichever one comes. All right? There is the crown of righteousness. That's recorded in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. It is awarded at the judgment seat of Christ to the church age believer who reaches, now listen to me, who reaches and maintains spiritual maturity through the faith cycle of the word of God and to die in grace. It's exactly what it is. And that's recorded in 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. I don't know that that's on your paper. And 6, 12. It is in that, it is in that 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20 when Paul says, listen, here's the problem. Some people who entered this race of spiritual grace, listen, spiritual grace momentum unto dying grace through spiritual growth maturity. Listen to what he says. Some have rejected and have suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. So that's verse 20. And listen, well, the saddest thing is to sit and watch people in a race and then turn around and walk away and throw their garments down and say, I'll never run that race ever again. And, and listen, it's the key to the Christian life. It's growing in the word of God and the word of God growing in you. It's one thing for you to grow in the word. It's another thing for the word to grow in you. When that combination works, we call it growing in spiritual maturity. And that's the name of the game. And so there's one for just staying faithful to the word of God. There's a crown called the crown of righteousness. Then there's the crown of glory. In 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, it is awarded at the judgment seat of Christ to the spiritually gifted pastor teacher who faithfully shepherds God's flock under his care. He is told in this passage that he must exercise oversight of spiritual growth, that he must not get involved in compulsory ideas nor loading, lording over his people under his care. He must voluntarily do his job. He must do it according to the will of God. He must never be engaged in ministry for money. It's called sordid gain. He must eagerly share what God is teaching him to his people. He must be eagerly sharing in the truth of the word of God to stimulate their spiritual grow, grow, uh, growth. And finally, when you read that, it'll say, it will tell you that he needs to prove himself. This is one, this is one that gets the pastor teacher, prove himself to be an example to the flock.
You can get disqualified. You could be a good pastor teacher. You could crank it out and still lose your reward. Because you haven't finished the course. Listen to me now. Listen to me now. According to the rules. See, for the pastor teacher, he set down rules. Now, there's rules for everybody. But boy, did he outline them in 1 Peter 5. He outlined them in a way that I haven't found them outlined in other ways. He has really hunkered down on uh, 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 those of us who believe they are pastor teachers. This is a big deal. It's not just to be a guy who can teach the word of God. You've got to play by the rules if you're a pastor teacher. If God has assigned, listen to me now. If God has assigned a flock under your care, he calls you a pastor teacher. And that pastor teacher who has been assigned a flock to care for is under these rules and will be assigned that crown. Then there is the crown of glory. Uh, that was the crown of glory. There is the crown of boasting. This, this goes, this 1 Thessalonians 1, 19 and 20. I gave you other scriptures. This is awarded at the judgment seat of Christ. Listen to me. To faithful ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you take seriously your ambassadorship and share the, the gospel of Christ with other people who need to hear. You receive the crown of glory. This crown of glory is an interesting when you read all the different passages about it. Listen, it can be reflected in while you're living, you will know that you're going to get the crown of glory of, uh, of boasting because you hear it back. In Philippians 4.1, Paul says to the Philippians, you are my crown of joy and rejoicing. You know what that is? That's already the reflected glory. In eternity, that's even going to be greater. That's already the reflected glory. Now, let, let me tell you how I know this. Well, first of all, the Bible says it, but in my own personal life and experience. One day I was reading this, and I was standing in a pulpit, and I had my sermon all done. I was standing in a pulpit and, and, and talking, and all of a sudden... The Spirit of God put in my heart that I should share part of my testimony. I stopped in the midst of this thing, and I shared my personal testimony about my conversion. And when I got through talking about how John Haggai had come to Tarrant City to Central Baptist Church and preached that gospel, this old, this old converted Jew firing out, you better get saved or you're going to fall into hell and burn. You know? And I went, not me, Lord, not me, dear God. When he, got, when he got through that week, and I got through with that whole deal, and, when I, and, and I told that story, and when, when, on my way home, on my way home, the father said to me, in my, in my spirit, not audibly like a bird flying or something, but in my spirit spoke to me and said, you know what we just did? I, I like what? I mean, I was there for two hours. What do you mean? He said that, you know, that personal testimony that you gave to John Haggai? I said, yeah. He said, you know what that was? Mm -mm. It was the reflected glory still on earth to a guy that's in heaven that's going to get the crown of boasting. And you know what you are? You're a testimony. You're a, you are a reflection of the testimony of the crown of, glory, of, of boasting. Isn't that interesting? And I went, ah, oh, that is so good. Thank you. See, so I share that with you. That reflected, that reflected glory. That's what John Haggai is going to have his entire life, and not just from me, but from others. But the crown of boasting comes, even part of it comes here, when it's the reflected glory of this guy's faithful ambassadorship of the gospel of Jesus Christ could save a sinner such as I. Our Father, we thank you today for these who have come our way and studied with us in this doctrine. We know we kind of sped, sped up a little bit on it, but we put it all down, Father, on paper. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. Uh, we spent a lot of times, a lot of time on the gift of life because it was the subject of our lesson. And I pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister this truth 
Not only that, Father, as we take the offering, we thank you, Father, for the way you put on the hearts of the people. We don't have to browbeat our people. You put it in their hearts what they should give. And we take that money and we give it back to you, Father, in great ministry opportunities. And we're thankful for that cycle of grace in Jesus' name. Amen.